Uh, hi, everyone. It's Howie Mann speaking. Uh, so let me start, if I can, by uh, very quickly uh, thanking Anton uh, Loff for his participation in this and Veronique Burkan. Uh, Anton uh, is the uh, independent consultant who, along with his partner, uh, Magnus uh, Olofsson, have uh, sorry, Magnus Eriksson, have prepared the report that we're speaking about today through their firm RMG Consulting. Uh, Anton has been working in the field of mining since uh, 2004, uh, where he's been focused on, on scrutinizing and out analyzing the mining market conditions in the private sector, as well as government-related issues. Uh, he's worked with various international organizations such as UNCTAD and the World Bank, and most recently with the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining for this project. Um, he's also been engaged over many years with governments in the Scandinavian region and in Africa, and is very active in the Chinese market analysis field. Um, Veronique is the policy advisor responsible for this project at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC, where she's uh, in the analysis and policy division. And she picked up this project uh, from Werner Tut, who uh, began this project with IASD uh, when it first started a couple of years ago. So welcome to you both and thank you for agreeing to participate here. The subject of this is commodity traders and commodity trading in the mining sector. And as Anton will explain, this is a very uh, focused issue uh, specific to private sector trading companies and minerals and metals, uh, as opposed to the integrated mining companies that do their own, have their own trading arms. Uh, and we focused on this particular part of the value chain to look at the impacts of independent traders, both uh, in terms of the task, uh, tax and fiscal regimes, and uh, a little bit more broadly in terms of the value that this part of the value chain brings to the whole process. Uh, and I think while we, um, began the research with some hypothesis that there were some, like we were likely to find some significant red flags for mining countries in terms of being able to manage this part of the sector. I think what we found in the, at the end of the process uh, was that the risks might actually be, the tax risks might actually be higher for the home countries of the trading companies rather than the uh, mining countries themselves. And I will, with that, turn it over to Anton to explain how uh, the work ended up with that conclusion uh, and what it means going forward. Uh, so Anton, if I can uh, turn it over to you. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm being prompted here. Um, we will go through, uh, in terms of the agenda, the research questions, uh, look a little bit at the design of commodity trading companies and commodity trading, uh, and then go through the, the meat of the uh, research on taxation and other risks, the recommendations, uh, and then the summary uh, of the work and open it for discussion, first for comment from Veronique and then open discussion. Um, Slide, please. And this is the other one I've been prompted for. Uh, if you do have questions, you'll see at the bottom of the window a Q&A box and a chat box. If you just scroll your mouse over the slide, you'll see that uh, that uh, row of features comes up. You can send written questions through the Q&A box or the chat box to everyone and or privately to the moderators and we will see them 
and either stop the presentation and uh, have them ask now or wait till the presentation is finished and uh, answer them at that time. So please do use that. That's what it's there for. Uh, we should have about a half an hour for Q&A if things work well, so lots of time for it. Okay, Anton, over to you, please. Thank you, Howard. <clears throat> um, so I'm Anton Lof or Love, as it is uh, in Swedish. Um, I'm uh, one of the writers of this report, and the second one was Magnus Eriksson, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, I will try to be very quick in this presentation. Um, and I look forward to any questions, if there is any. Um, uh, considering the timing, of course, we can't go through the entire report, but we will at least highlight some of the uh, interesting points that we found. Uh, because this is an area, commodity traders and commodity trading companies, that is quite difficult to find a lot of data about. Um, it might be good to have that in the background when we talk about this. And so we started out with some specific research questions. How are commodity traders involved in buying and selling mineral production from private mining companies in host countries? Host countries is the country of the mine. Do these transactions create risks for host country governments? And if so, what are they? And what effect might these tax risks have on government revenue collection in host countries? But of course, we also wanted to look at how could these tax risks be addressed? Uh, and then we wanted to look at it from both the home country of the commodity trader, as well as the host country of the uh, mining company. Slide, please. Uh, we put up some limitations just to make sure that uh, this report wouldn't go on forever. So we were only looking at trade in non-fuel minerals. Uh, when we talk about commodity trading companies, it's quite important to know also that most of the traded goods by these commodity traders are in fact in oil and gas. So mining or metals and minerals come sort of at uh, second uh, most important area and the third is in agriculture. We were also only looking at trade of mineral and metal products by privately held mining companies to independent trading companies. Um, the reason for this was that WISD uh, thought that the um, issue of transfer pricing has been discussed and were discussed in many other reports. And they wanted to look at this from a slightly different perspective. And then of course, um, tax risk created in such trade. We also sort of limited this to commodity trading companies and we defined those as um, companies that trade in physical commodities. Quite a lot of the trading in commodities is uh, purely speculative of buying sort of paper commodities that is just purely turned over into another company and goes on. But we wanted to look at those that actually ship material. It should also be a company that had a dominant share of their revenues come from trading. And that most of the traded goods should be primary commodities. Slide please. Sorry, slide again. 
So let's start off with sort of why trade? And uh, the iron ore trade gives a good example of this. Less than 30% of iron ore is turned into steel in the country where it was produced. So we have, um, we have built up a global trading that sort of needs the trade of raw materials. And um, you can also, from this picture, sort of see the value of, or get a glimpse of the value. If you think of China here as importing roughly one billion ton of iron ore, and one ton of iron is roughly speaking worth 50 US dollar, then you can sort of get a picture of part of this trade, how much it's worth. But if we go to the next slide, it's very important also to understand that commodity trading companies, as we define them, do not, um, they're not responsible for all of this trade. If you look at the iron ore, most of the trade is actually between the mining companies and the steelworks themselves. In fact, it's roughly 20% of the iron ore that is traded uh, by commodity trading companies. Uh, depending on the uh, raw material, this differs a bit. And uh, zinc is one of the uh, raw materials where most of the material is traded by commodity trading companies. And of course, this has to do with the fact that Glencore is such a large producer of zinc. So, but in, in general terms, commodity trading companies, they generally don't trade with the large miners, but with the smaller and mid miners, which means that they will have less than 50% um, of the market. And as you can see here, for most of the more important metals, it's even less than that. Next slide. So the business model of commodity trading companies is of course acting on market inefficiencies and sort of direct commodities to where they are most valued. It's, it's generally a low margin, it's a high volume business. And if you look at the activities that they actually are involved in, it's of course buying and selling metals but it's also a sort of risk management from the point of view of the miners as they, the, when the commodity trading companies take over the product, they also take over the risk from the mine. Storing and logistics has always been important for commodity trading companies. Um, they have also moved both upstream and downstream and uh, one of the most important elements of the commodity trading companies today is financing. Um, since the global uh, financial crisis, many banks, global banks stepped out of the mining industry. And when they stepped out, the commodity traders stepped in and started providing financing to both projects and operating mines. And this is one of the most important functions they have in the sense that they can provide um, money for products basically when the product leaves the mine instead of the miner having to wait several months before they can get paid. Um, with the buying and selling of metals, some commodity trading companies 
may speculate also in commodities. But when you talk to traders, and this study is based very much on interviews with a lot of traders, ex-traders, and other people within the industry, they always claim that what they do is as soon as they buy something, they sell it immediately and take that little margin that they can make in between as the profit. Um, I think that the, um, the fact that companies like the Noble Group has more or less disappeared um, tells us that at least our appetite for risk is at least sometimes uh, a little higher than that. Let's have a look at the next slide. So, uh, historically, the commodity traders were quite small companies that collected the, uh, the metal production or the mineral production of various mines and then sold them off to someone that could uh, make use of this. But lately that has, uh, that sort of business model isn't enough. Um, if you're a producer or something, you can most probably find your customer online these days. So many of the traders have started to go both upstreams and downstreams and um, logistics has been a very, the infrastructure around logistics has been very important here. And what we're talking about then is ports, warehouses, lending facilities, but uh, also sometimes refining facilities. This sort of adds value to what the trader can uh, give to the miner and sort of explain their take of the profits. Um, it do seem like mining is a little more difficult and Glencore is here the exception, but most of the commodity traders that we've looked at that have gone into mining haven't made much of that. Um, this is, I, this might be an area where we will see more both sort of miners going into trading and traders going into miners in the future. But currently Glencore is the exception. Um, let's have a look at the next slide. Uh, one thing we've noticed is that metal trading companies are moving east. Uh, this slide just shows where the traders are situated. Um, it doesn't take into consideration the sort of value of the business. This is number of companies. Um, but if you think back to that slide with the iron ore trade, you notice that most of the import is, or the export is going to China. And this has been the case for the last 10, 15 years. And this is also one of the areas of the geographical areas where most traders operate. So most of the traders that do sell uh, minerals and metals are selling them to China. So it's not that it's it's not a revelation really that uh, the traders are moving east in the sense that they are supplying the eastern markets, but they have also moved east in the sense that they are moving their headquarters to Singapore, etc. Um, we have seen that. A lot of traders have moved out of the United States and the UK, for example. So far they stopped in uh, Switzerland, but it does seem like there are at least 
thinking of moving further east or establishing um, not headquarters but other offices in um, the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Almost all of the uh, commodity traders are private, and this is also one of the reasons why it's so hard to find any information about them. Either they're private or they are owned by another company, and in most cases, those companies, the owners, are also private. Um, there's just a few that are public, but some of the really large ones are, of course, public. And considering the costs, if commodity traders want to move upstream and downstream, it might be so that the part that are public will increase. Uh, next slide. So let's have a look at the tax risks, if we can move on. It's uh, quite important to understand that uh, commodity traders do provide a service and these services do come at a cost. That's not very um, different from any other uh, industry really. But what is a little interesting is that sometimes that cost, the cost of using a trader, may be recovered by higher sales prices that the traders can get from knowing the market better than the miner. So when we're looking at these costs, um, we need to understand whether or not these services are at a reasonable cost. We also need to understand what would the mining company or the mining industry within the host country be without the commodity trading company because of these facts of commodity traders providing finance to actually make mining possible at certain points. So all of these costs need to be weighted in relation to other costs. If they, if a bank would provide financing, of course, there would be a cost there as well. So the question is, are the costs more or less than they could get from somewhere, from some other company? Next slide, please. But since there is a cost, there is, of course, a tax risk in relation to the profits of the uh, miners and these can be divided in certain ways in the sense that if a commodity trader buys and sells a product they will take a share of the profit um, if they provide financing they want a share for that um, also, if they own some equity in the mines, uh, there are risks. Um, in this study, we're not really looking at those risks, but some of those conclusions have become two and that we will discuss later uh, can be used to sort of mitigate that transfer risk as well. Another risk is the fact that many of the commodity trading companies are in low tax locations. Uh, it's also so that financial disclosure and lack of transparency is quite high in the commodity trading sphere. Um, also lack of corporate regulations are a real problem when it comes to commodity trading companies. Next slide, please. But coming back here to what 
Howard mentioned earlier, in the host country, we know where the mine is. And we know that the companies, the miners and the traders isn't linked. So the products that are being exported can be tracked quite easily. At least there are ways of doing it. So the risk here is actually lower. But in the home country of the commodity trader, the picture here shows home country of Glencore subsidiaries in 2017. I would assume or I would think that it's quite easy to manipulate or if you want to be nicer, it can be quite hard for someone within the home country of the commodity trader to understand where did the trade take place within the structure of the commodity trader. So the risk here is much higher. Next slide, please. So what can we do about combating these uh, tax risks? Next slide. We put together some recommendations. Um, these slides that I will show now are just uh, sort of the short version of them. Um, the longer are of course within the report. But uh, to combat tax risks in the home and host country, you need to have adequate knowledge of what is exported or imported. And uh, what we're talking here about commodities, um, you also need to understand what the miner is bringing into the host country to be able to mine so that you know any offsets between imports and exports. You need access to sales contracts. You also need a knowledge of the mining sector. And this is what I'm talking about earlier. You need a knowledge of the mining sector, not just the mine and the operation of the mine, but the entire sector. What is needed to start a mine, what is needed to operate the mine, what is needed to close down the mine. All of this is important to understand and be able to sort of either affirm what the companies say they have spent or argue against the spending. All of this, of course, needs to be up to date and you need to understand the market situation for each of the commodities that are concerned here. So commodity prices, taxes, etc. all of this is interesting. This would enable the host and home country to establish whether an individual deal is appropriate and correct. And this is a start. Next slide, please. To do this, you may need to strengthening the legal framework. And the legal framework should make sure that information and data that is needed are supplied and can be used properly. It doesn't matter if you have it, if you can't use it. It also means that the correct data is supposed to be in the contracts and cal tax calculations. It should be easy and you should be able to replicate it, sort of. Um, to have some bargaining power, you could um, further use um, sort of right of approval of exporting, for example. Another issue that is very important here is the transparency. Um, we talked about legislate increased finance disclosure by commodity trading companies. 
uh, but also legislates a greater level of public finance disclosure by privately owned mining companies and private companies in general. This is often lacking internationally. In Sweden, it's all of the annual reports are public, which isn't the case in most countries. But it might be an idea to think about that. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about transparency, we want to reduce the opportunities for corrupt behavior. And one of the best uh, places to start here is the EITI. Um, but there are similar international corporations or agreements that you could look at. Um, EITI is primarily um, sort of a product for states, countries, and governments, but commodity trading and mining companies should become supporting members and supply what they can within this framework. And also, if you collect, as a government, you collect the, uh, the uh, sort of the information about export sales and the contracts, you could publish with an appropriate time lag certain key facts. And we would argue that those could include um, buyer, seller, location of buyer, uh, specific details of the commodity, so you have, <coughs> sorry, volume, detail composition and type, price, taxes and fees paid, intended destination, you can think about a lot more, but with these details, you can backtrack and look, was the sale in, was the sale sort of not appropriate, but did they, did the miner get enough for what they sold or were they fooled or is there some foul play? Um, home countries should collect and publish aggregate data on trading companies. This is definitely missing internationally. There is very little aggregate data on trading companies. Next slide. Well, summary. Oh, we're already here. Uh, let's have the next slide and just summarize this and uh, then we can go on to questions. So global trade of commodities creates economic efficiencies. The trade is necessary here. Commodity trading companies are a necessary part of the mining industry. Commodity trading companies are a tax risk. We're talking about cost, geographical location of trader, lack of transparency, lack of regulation. But the host country can combat this tax risk, mainly through a detailed understanding of what is exported and the contracts, but also an understanding of the mining industry and the commodity markets and up-to-date data. A home country should and or could demand more data from commodity trading companies and publish at least some of that data. And transparency is one of the keys here. Make more data available. And uh, me, I like EITI. Thank you. I think that's, uh, that's it for me, at least for now. Okay, thank you, Anton. Uh, I, I think that was really very clear, so I'm not going to try and summarize anything. Uh, Veronique, if we can just uh, pass the floor to you for some comments uh, on the, the paper and the result, uh, that would be great. Yes, uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you, Anton, for um, the presentation. 
Um, I just wanted to briefly comment on the report from a development agency perspective. Um, as it was mentioned at the beginning, this report was supported um, by SDC, so the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Um, we supported uh, this report because, as it is mentioned in the report, mining is increasingly happening in developing countries including in sub-Saharan countries, and where we see uh, actually a high rate of dependency on commodity export. So while this represents a potential for revenues, it also comes with a lot of challenges. Environmental, social, human rights, conflict challenges, but also governance challenges. So what are the deals? How are the revenues distributed? How are they spent? So for us, the question is really how can mining and more globally, the extractive industry benefit the population and support sustainable and inclusive development. I think this is really the starting point for us with also this study. Um, I think the report shows very well that mining and trading of minerals are complex endeavors, but it is also rather opaque. And if we want mining to benefit the populations, there is definitely a need um, to better understand how everyday business is being done, the roles of the different actors along the value chain in the host and in the home countries, and also the risks that are related to potential illicit financial flows. Um, so from our perspective, actually a major contribution of this study is that it really helps us better understand the business and its complexity, as well as the key role um, that traders play in the industry, industry. I think it also helps us, especially for non-expert, to really fully appreciate the ever increasing complexity tax administrations are faced with. And it is really this complexity combined with opacity that increases uh, potential risks, as actually all the risks uh, described in the, in the study. So, while this analysis portrays really a complex system, and it's not an easy read, I must uh, say, um, I would say that the recommendations to reduce risks are actually rather straightforward. And I would argue that they are nothing really new, but the big problem or the, the major challenge is of course to implement those uh, recommendation, recommendations, including from a policy coherence for a sustainable development perspective. So I clustered them actually in three major recommendations. Um, one is to support initiatives that foster transparency um, on the deals, on the revenue allocation, and then also the use of data. Then it's this support to host governance, governments and the administration to better understand the sector and the industry to adequately then tax it, price it, manage it. And then is the strengthening of the legal frameworks, both in home and source countries. So as I said, actually nothing really new. And some of these uh, recommendations, actually development agencies are trying to, to, uh, um, to implement or contribute to implement them. And I think a major challenge for a development perspective is also then really to assess to what extent these various initiatives and programs that we are supporting, being on transparency, support to host government to build their capacities in terms of taxing the mining industries, how these initiatives are really achieving their objectives, changing the sector and helping uh, mitigate risks. Because, and I think this was not really mentioned in the presentation, but since this was really supported by a development agency, I think we should keep in mind that this study is also really part of uh, an initiative to, to try to make mining um, a contribution to sustainable development. And that actually our main objective at the end is also to, to reduce uh, poverty. Um, so I would like to leave it here and uh, leave the floor for questions to the, uh, to the author and for discussions from the participants. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Veronique. That's 
that's really quite a uh, helpful comment. I really like the language that you used on the, uh, the issues being a reflection of the complexity combined with the opacity of the uh, sector. And I think that's a really neat way to summarize the challenges. Um, with that, I think we'll put it open for questions uh, right away. Uh, again, if you just scroll your um, cursor over the slide, you can see at the bottom the Q&A or the chat boxes, so you can ask your questions in either of those, and we can read them out. Um, I don't see any questions yet. Um, I would have thought this would raise a few. Let, let me make one or two quick comments then while we give people a chance to add in some questions. Um, I, I think that um, the focus on transparency is really important. I think one of the really interesting things that we found in this study is that the commodity traders, the independent commodity traders, because they do act very much in a market environment and it is a low margin type of business, um, one of the parts of the mining sector that they're actually really important for is the small and medium sized mining producers who may not have access to global markets to sell to. So the niche that many of these trading companies work in is not necessarily uh, with the biggest producers who often do have marketing arms, the biggest mining companies that often do have marketing arms, but with the smaller and medium sized companies that are often very active in developing countries as well. Um, not all mines are huge mines, and in the category below that, the trading companies have a particularly important role to play in the market in getting the resources produced to market. Um, where So there, there's a real market function there, and that's Anton's initial comments in terms of the costs and the structure of, of the sector. Um, Sorry, Howard, can I? Yeah, please. Put in a little thing there. Yeah. It's, we come into this study with the sense that mining and the mining sector can make a difference for developing countries. And exactly as you point out here, for there to be a mining sector within a country, sometimes there needs to be capital coming in from somewhere else, some uh, richer country. And this is one of the most important that the trader provide these days. So mm -hmm. from in, there, there is this, uh, this need that they fulfill and we talk about a lot about transparency and that is important but if you actually have the knowledge of the industry and the knowledge of the sort of global sector you could if we're talking exports you could sort of hire companies that do check what is exported to make sure that you have a good understanding of what is leaving the country and you can make sure that that is taxed appropriately, whether or not it has been uh, sort of um, priced appropriately. Yep. Okay. Uh, we do have some questions now. Uh, so I'd like to turn to them. Uh, two of them are directly related to EITI, so I'll, I'll put those two together. Uh, the first one is, how can the EITI in host countries contribute to trading transparency in minerals and metals in host and home countries? 
uh, given it's mostly targeting uh, governments. The related question on e EITI is many of the transparency initiatives uh, you described, EITI, payments to governments, legislation, and so on, required disclosure of transactions with governments or state-owned companies. Since the study only looked at private-to-private -private transactions, what specifically could EITI and complementary legislation do here? So I give you both of those, Anton. Thank you. Um, I do agree that the EITI is a bit problematic in this sense, and especially within this study. But uh, let's also remember that the EITI is expanding and they've been talking about looking into commodity trading companies. And it should be seen from that point of view. And also the general, the more we know about what is um, sold and traded in a country, the better, the better sort of basis we have to understand the trade that is going on. But yes, EITI is just a start because as um, Joe points out, it's mainly uh, in relation to government companies and governments. I'm not okay. sure if you wanna add something there, Howard. No, no, I don't think so. Um, let's come back to a couple of other questions in. Um, so we had from Frederick Chenea, what would be your main advice to host countries, the mining countries, to avoid transfer of profit to other countries? So I think you've addressed this, Anton, maybe you can summarize. Uh, yes, I would, I would argue that what you need to know is, sorry, the fact that we're talking exports make it slightly easier here because it's easier to keep track of what is exported. Um, but you need to understand exactly what leaves the country. It doesn't, you know, you can't say that it's gold ore. You need to understand the percentage of gold within the ore. You need to understand where the payments are made, etc. This can be done. It's not, it, it costs a little, but it's not very complicated. Uh, of course, you need a certain size of the mining industry for it to be worthwhile. But anyway, you can do it. So that is one part. The other is, of course, you need to understand how much is it worth on the global market? And then sort of third area is if the mining company is buying things and importing things to make sure the mining can take place, are those things properly priced? Uh, so this comes back to what I'm, we're saying that you need to understand the mining industry, not just mining you need to understand sort of the complexity and all of it, and starting from, you know, grassroots exploration going on so that you have an understanding of the problems of the miners and the problems of the traders as well. Generally speaking, there's so few projects actually become a mine. So, you can ta tax them too much because then there will be there will not be any mines. Um, so again, it comes back to having good knowledge of the entire sector and specific knowledge about what is exported and how that has been priced. Yeah, let let me follow that up for a second if I can. In our, uh, the um, project on BEPS in mining, base erosion and profit shifting in mining that 
the IGF Secretariat is managing for the IGF, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining and Sustainable Development. Um, what we have found across a broad range of profit shifting, pra potential profit shifting practices is that the ability of governments to properly evaluate and monitor exactly what is being exported is really critical. Uh, so this relates to royalties, or it relates to profits, it relates to um, a whole series of issues uh, that fall under the BEPS umbrella. Uh, and I think it, it was initially a little bit of a surprise to us how much that particular factor, that particular issue, uh, how often that comes back as a core issue for developing countries. So it's not just in relation to this study, uh, it's in relation to a whole series of issues that we see that ability of governments to fully understand the value of what is being exported is critical. And Anton is right there. It's not just a question of tonnage or number of ounces or whatever the case might be. Uh, it's, it's also a question of understanding grade and quality and the market conditions at any given time and so on. So we are expanding our work specifically on that issue uh, and trying to build uh, a better understanding of how to assist developing countries specifically on that issue. Um, I want to turn, if I can, now to the uh, question from uh, Irene. Um, thank you for your comment. I'm liking the study very much. Then you ask, can you elaborate further on how a country may enact uh, that certain terms, options, caps, and lower limits be included in metal streaming agreements, long-term supply arrangements, and other complex trade deals uh, in commodities? And I think that's a, a really good question. Um, part of that is understanding how these arrangements work. So again, metal streaming is one of the specific issues we're studying in the BEPS and mining project that we've undertaken. Uh, and we're just beginning to unpack uh, a number of those issues. Um, but I think it, it becomes a question of understanding the issues and putting in place the right demands for information against uh, the commodity trading companies in this case, uh, or the original mining companies who are exporting if there isn't a trader involved. Anton, do you want to, do you have some further, more perhaps detailed ideas here? Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> uh, when it comes to meta streaming, what we're talking about is uh, giving up a future uh, production for a specific price in compensation for a certain amount of money transferred today. And um, one thing that I found interesting here is that it's, this is not something that only small companies do. Um, large companies sell streaming deals as well. And even a company like Glencore sells part of their production on a streaming deal. So the, the actual streaming deal is probably not in itself um, sort of a, a problem for the miner. The problem for the uh, government or the host country is of course that if they sell a future production for a too low cost, there will be revenue will be in another com uh, country, the home country of the uh, of now the um, royalty owner, and that is of course problematic. I uh, I I'm not sure how to deal with this. To be honest, um, of course, they have 
gotten a, um, a profit to start with or a income to start with the miner and that should be taxed but depending on all the various tax issues that might be might be problematic to tax that straight on um, so when it comes to these royalty deals of course um, one important tool could be um, you know the royalties from the government that each tonnage produced should pay something to the host country <clears throat> um, I, I think we're talking about that in the report and say that another important thing is that if it's for the life of mine it should sort of state that it's for a certain production capacity of the mine as well, so that um, the initial money received for the trader to the uh, miner is sort of fair in relation to how much is mined in the future. Um, but royalty deals are complicated and they're complicated to make fair, so to say. Um, Long-term supply arrangements, those are more likely to be sort of priced according to some sort of, uh, in relation to some global price. Uh, so that's, that's probably less of a problem. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Howard. Sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, we, we do see specifically on this question, then I'll come to the last three questions. Um, we do see specifically on, on this particular point, some kind of unusual practices that seem to come up in the metal streaming contracts that are used in for finance. Um, a, a number of these actually relate not to the primary commodity mined, but to secondary minerals or metals that might be produced. And this in a sector that at times has a history of uh, sort of focusing between the the producer, the actual mining company, and the government only on the major commodity produced and not including revenues from the 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 secondary or or third level commodity that gets produced at the same time, and sometimes the streaming agreements are actually attached to those secondary or third level production elements. Yes, um, Howard, could I yeah. just point out that? That is true. Most of the deals are for the secondary metals. And yeah. from the miners' point of view, this has to do with the fact that generally the stock market does not value the secondary metals properly, or at least so say the miners. So by um, going out and selling those buy, uh, secondary metals uh, on a streaming deal, not only will they get sort of cash in hand they will increase the stock value because they're getting that cash in hand oh yeah yeah no i understand that component but from the government revenue side uh the implication of that thinking has been that royalties have not been charged on those secondary materials royalties have often only been charged on the primary commodity uh and that's where we see a real disconnect emerging between uh, some of these agreements and government revenue. So it's going to be extremely important for governments to ensure that they capture the value uh, in one way or another of those secondary type commodities that are being mined and uh, essentially not allow them to leave the country without factoring into uh, either royalty and or profit taxes in one way or another uh, as part of how the financing stream works. So it, it's been a practice, there's reasons for it, but 
it also, um, for lack of a better word, a bit of a loophole uh, that governments need to close in order to be able to address the revenue issues fully in the context of these agreements. Um, and then we're coming back to this question that as a host country government, you need to have exact understanding of what is leaving the country. Yeah, exactly. And uh, sort of to understand the industry around it so that you can see that it's not just copper, it's gold and silver as well. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Uh, and that those are going to be complexities uh, that need to be addressed. But the fact that finance companies or uh, finance arms or trading companies are using that as ways to help finance mines shows at a minimum they can be valued because these companies are putting real value to them. So we know it can be done. The question is, is making sure governments are enabled to do that fully. Um, let me go to the last, to two out of the last three questions and then the final question from Gregoire. So um, uh, Irene had a second question which relates to one from Anna Sophia. Um, how, do, uh, how do you deal with commodity triangulation where the commodity is shipped directly to the purchaser's destination, but through a trader located in a low tax jurisdiction. So the purchaser is invoiced by the trader and the intermediary jurisdictions at a higher price, which may lead to profit shifting and so on. And the related question, what is needed to bring home, the home countries trading hubs to start collecting data and addressing the risks in the sector while hubs often have low taxation like Switzerland, may be lost. Uh, tax revenue is not the main argument to convince the hubs to publish data and put regulation in place. Um, so these two are related questions because in fact, it's, it's the trading companies that are involved in what the first question referred to as triangulation. Um, so Anton, would you like to tackle these two? Um, I don't know. That was the short answer. <laughs> but, but of course, what we're talking about here, we're talking about home country and um, it's generally the, what do the country demand of its companies operating there? And as we pointed out earlier, the, you know, it, a company like Glencore do have a lot of companies in various places and making sure that whatever should be taxed in the right country is actually taxed in the right country is, that's a tricky question. Uh, I'm not sure if Ali wanted to say something about that. Um, no, well, let, let me just add, uh, it, it is a tricky question. Um, I think in terms of the host country, the mining country engagement in, with this issue, there are ways in which to compel um, uh, taxpayers, in this case, to provide evidence of the value of the transaction. So if the initial transaction uh, with a trading company, the initial sale, which is the one tightly tied to the host country, uh, really is below market price or, or market price plus a reasonable profit for the trading company, um, then you can ask for uh, the onward sale contracts as well as the tax administration authority to prove the market value if the tax laws allow you to, to challenge that market value in the transaction, uh, which more and more tax regimes do and which is something that we're looking to make sure all developing countries have the capacity to do in their laws where it becomes 
more difficult might actually be for the home countries, and this is where it relates to the second question, uh, the home countries are the traders um, of the trading companies, uh, are they getting proper revenues? Um, and that's because it's their companies that are, uh, as the trading companies, uh, using tax havens, in a sense, to shift profit to lowest tax jurisdictions. Uh, and because things can be traded on paper over the internet, uh, you know, uh, by electronic means, it's very easy for companies to, to be able to do that and, in fact, trade the same product two or three or four times if they want to. Uh, and I agree that's very difficult. Whether the lost tax revenue is the main argument to convince the hubs to publish data and put regulation in place, I don't know. Maybe Veronique is better placed to answer that one, but I'm not sure she'll want to be put on the spot for that question. Um, yeah, Howard, I think it's probably just a question of what is what is the people in the country, how do they want their country to be run? That's, it's more of a, I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's not really a tax question or a tax law question. Uh, no, it's, it may not be a tax law question per se, but I think, you know, with the growing uh, emphasis internationally on uh, profit shifting by multinational corporations, I think we are seeing a much greater sensitivity to the issue. Uh, and for example, and not to, not to focus just on Switzerland here, but one could very much see, you know, the ability of government revenue authorities, which we see in multiple sectors, being enhanced in the mining sector to be able to transfer information between taxpayer jurisdictions to follow these kinds of issues. And that would improve uh, revenue collection enforceability, both in the developing country, mining country, and the home country of the trading companies. Uh, so there are smaller steps that can be taken there also that do relate to the what you might call two motivations. Uh, the one Veronique mentioned earlier about mining contributing in a positive way to sustainable development in the host country, but also to removing the incentives and closing the gaps for revenue collection in the home country of the trader. Um, in some ways, this relates to the last question by Gregoire, is the geographical move to the east for trading companies linked to higher regulations in Europe, Europe and the United States as well, I would add there. Uh, what are the key factors there? And Anton, I know we've had some discussions on that, so maybe you can, in one yes. minute, give a quick answer to that. <laughs> of course. Um, it, um, first of all, it seems to be the fact that since trade is going to mainly China here, that is one of the most important reasons for the shift in uh, traders. The other is, yes, the regulations, but it seems to be more linked to the move out of the United States rather than Europe. So for now, they're moved sort of from the United States to Europe and onwards. Um, so it doesn't seem that the regulation in Europe yet, maybe, is affecting this, but um, rather the, uh, the fact that the trade, the metals are moving to the East. Um, but as I mentioned, and um, within the US, it seems to be more linked to regulations. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Um, and I think we do also see some links into the, uh, those jurisdictions that are more aggressively pursuing tax avoidance by multinational companies 
and those that perhaps we can say are less aggressive in pursuing those issues. Um, and because uh, the trade aspect, the second and third trade of, of the commodity, or if you go through uh, blending and refining processes, all of that can become more and more opaque. Uh, those tax haven um, profit shifting uh, issues might become more salient for a number of these countries in terms of where they're locating. So I think there might be a pull in the sense of what Anton mentioned, the markets are moving more to the east, but there might also be a push from the regulatory side as well that we're seeing both in terms of regulating the company transactions and transparency, but also on the BEP side. Yeah, um, I mean, these uh, questions are linked, of course, in the sense that there are many traders that are let's just take an example that there are traders that are focused on the Nordic countries. Of course, they're not going to move out of the Nordic countries because of regulations, because their market in, is in that specific geographical area. But since there's a, so much trade going on, uh, moving to the East, um, those that can move, to a lower tax jurisdiction, uh, less transparent, they might be uh, compelled to do so. Yeah. There, there's certainly a business logic there. <laughs> Unfortunate. But, yeah. Uh, okay, so with that, that's the last question we have. So uh, allow me if I can to take one minute first to uh, thank Anton for, for participating in this. Uh, first, Veronique, do you want to add any closing comments here? Um, Howie, Veronique had to sign off. She had a commitment uh, immediately after uh, our okay. webinar. Had to okay, let I did see early. Okay, so first let me thank Anton and Magnus for really some incredible work. As Anton said at the beginning, data is very hard to get in this field and being able to use the long-term connections that they have in the mining industry to undertake the original research that they did, the interviews that they did, the data collection that they did was really incredible to watch uh, how they were able to pull that together uh, and produce an report, a report that truly is based on original research uh, and original empirical study. Um, and I also wanted to thank SDC so we can send this back to Veronique at the end. Um, that actually really supported the fact that the findings were based on original research and uh, allowed the project to go very much where the empirical evidence pointed the project should go uh, and resisted the temptation to uh, uh, use the project to support pre-identified conclusions uh, that in the end weren't, uh, weren't accurate. So we really were able to go with the research and this is uh, the result that you see in the report. So I think in that sense, it's an extremely uh, valuable piece of research. It's an extremely honest report, if I can put it that way, uh, because we really were able to go where, where the research led us to go. Uh, and finally, for all our help in putting this webinar together, thank you very much, Sophia, um, who many of you received multiple emails from uh, advertising and ensuring uh, your presence here. So thank you, Sophia, for all of that. And to all of you for joining, thank you very much for your interest in this. And we hope it's uh, useful to you, uh, the webinar and the final report in, in your own work, in your own analysis of these issues. So thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, I wish you a good rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you all very much. And we're adjourned.